Great, let's get started here. Um, thanks to everybody that joined the uh, General Assembly meeting today. This is our annual General Assembly, which actually is happening a little later this year, I think, only because of uh, we tried to time it with the Hanover Fair. We had also hoped to perhaps have this meeting in person, but uh, that clearly didn't work out. So uh, we're doing it virtually here. Although I did have a chance to run into some of the folks in, uh, in uh, Hanover, at Hanover, uh, and uh, we're wondering what room the meeting was in. And I said, well, it's not, it's virtual because we weren't sure we could actually. Anyway, with that, uh, this is Steve Bagaki, Managing Director uh, of the FTT Group. And again, as I mentioned, this is our annual meeting. Uh, what I want to do is just give you an idea uh, about uh, the uh, agenda for this meeting. Um, oh, hang on a second here. Hopefully back to screen sharing. Okay, the the agenda for this meeting uh, is actually uh, two major or three major parts, I guess I'd say. Uh, the first part is really a, a number of compulsory type things uh, that we have to go through as identified by our bylaws for the FTT group. Uh, the second piece, uh, which I think is probably uh, one of the more important pieces, is we have a keynote speaker this year, uh, Paul Marath um, from PNG is going to give us uh, some perspective. And some of the things that he's dealing with and looking for uh, for intelligent devices. Um, I will then uh, give a little response to that um, and uh, you know, make a few comments. And then we've got our informational proceedings. So that's kind of the third part. Uh, where we'll have some, hear from some of our officers of board, specifically around standards and associations with Shannon Boos, uh, technology and tool release uh, discussion with Saria, uh, and I'll go over some of the marketing activities, okay? So again, kind of three major sections to the meeting today. Um, get going here. Uh, just as a way of introduction, uh, since I haven't met all of the uh, uh, General Assembly members yet, uh, I'm Steve Bagaki, as I mentioned. Uh, I was most recently doing some management advisory work uh, with a company called BDO. Don't ask me what BDO stands for, um, but it's a, uh, an advisory accounting and tax firm. Uh, part of that, I, I worked in the uh, professional AV business for a little while. And then most of my career, though, quite frankly, has been with uh, two companies, the majority of my career with Belden, uh, where I led the global sales and marketing organization. And then obviously at Rockwell Automation for almost 30 years, where I had a number of different jobs. Um, one of the more rewarding jobs that I had through my time there was actually starting our networks business uh, back in the mid 90s, quite frankly. Uh, where we started to do networking standardization and things like that and started to invent things like SIP uh, and so on. So, in fact, I was instrumental and in I got the ODBA started and got the SIP spec uh, accepted and so on. So, my background and some of the more rewarding things came out of doing some of that work, which is actually how I ended up in the FTT organization uh, here, uh, this part of my career. So, I'm an electrical engineer by schooling and spent some time um, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I was born and raised. I went to school there and then also uh, did some work for my uh, MBA. So anyway, just a little bit of my background that it would be helpful for folks to get a perspective. You know, it's been interesting. I've been in this position now since January officially. And I looked at, you know, kind of the organization and I, the, the group, one of the greatest things is that the membership and also the, uh, the number of uh, working groups that we have and kind of the diligence around that has just been really kind of amazing and, and pretty pretty impressive. Uh, the fact that, you know, the FDT3 spec has obviously been completed for a while. Uh, you know, the tools are now completed and surreal. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, we've got a number of pilot projects that we've identified for FDT3 specifically. And then we've had a number of collaborations, which Shannon will talk more about later uh, as we go through this, okay? And then I would say that one of the other accomplishments uh, has been the creation of campaigns. Uh, and these are marketing campaigns around things like FTT and this whole concept of the FTT unified environment, uh, one for you know device configuration and so on. And we'll talk more about that later when we get into some of the marketing topics. Some of the challenges, though, I think that you know operating over the last two years is presented for both the industry and the organization is really the inability to demonstrate the benefits uh, of the latest releases of the FTT spec. 
I mean, a lot of people did a lot of work on this. They went off and created a lot of good tools to help developers actually build to the specification. But the fact that, you know, we've been kind of lights out and people haven't been allowed in plants, they haven't been allowed to do things together, that is, I think, really put kind of a damper on a lot of the activities that could have possibly been going on and also the progress. I think also discuss possible hat enhancements based on user feedback. I mean, look, you know, there's always Series A and then there'll be other releases after that or 1.0 or whatever you want to call it of the FTT3 specification. I'm sure there's things we can improve. It's always great to get the user feedback to get that. And I think that's just something we've missed because we haven't been able to work together. And then of course, related is just completing the pilot installations that we've been talking about. So anyway, I think given what's going on and the fact that we've been operating in this virtual environment for the last couple of years has made it a little bit more challenging, but we are what we are. I think it's a new day. It's a new day with the FDT group. And I think that some of the things that we have planned going forward and that you'll hear about are actually gonna help uh, you know, drive more market acceptance and uh, well awareness, first of all, of the great work that everybody on the team has done. So just wanted to share just a couple observations with you before we kind of get into the compulsory things here. By the way, uh, on this call today, uh, you have a chat box that you can use and you're able to go ahead and actually uh, type in uh, questions. So if you have questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, do that. Uh, I will uh, go ahead and Katie will actually monitor the questions as they come in. Uh, and, you know, whether they're any part of the agenda here, any of the topics, uh, and uh, specifically when we get to Paul's presentation, there may be questions and we'll just kind of hold those till the end of his presentation uh, so we can get those to him and maybe he can uh, dialogue and, and discuss some of that with us, okay? Uh, our first uh, kind of compulsory thing that we need to do for our bylaws is we need have a quorum for the meeting. Uh, we actually have uh, 34 corporate members that are present. Uh, we've got 14 represented in person, uh, none by proxy. So uh, we've got 41%, uh, which means that our bylaws state that we only need 30% of our corporate members to be present. So, hey, we're ahead of the curve right now. And uh, that's good. We can move on with the meeting. So I wasn't sure what was going to happen if that didn't happen. But uh, good. We've got 41% and there's required so we can move forward, all right? Okay, uh, we've got some voting procedures that we have to go through, and this is again, part of the compulsory work that we need to do. And perhaps different than we've done in other uh, years past, uh, what I'm gonna do is ask for just somebody to uh, agree or motion uh, by using the raise your hand feature, uh, I'm, I'm making a motion. Uh, and then only voting members may actually make motions. So I may call on some of the voting members or I may have Katie help me with that. Uh, then you need to use the voting members actually have the user supplied. There was a, a link that was supplied. Everybody should have received. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll show the uh, results later as we uh, get towards the end of the meeting. Uh, all members present are welcome to ask questions as I mentioned and offer comments and if you want to, uh, feel free to go ahead and just use the question feature, all right? Katie Jones is going to take the meetings of this minute, uh, or the meetings, of, she's going to take the minutes of this meeting, uh, so we can go ahead and have that, and we're also recording the entire session, all right? So with that, one of our first uh, agenda items, I always find this kind of interesting, is we have to approve the agenda. Uh, I discussed the agenda before with the three major areas that we're going to focus on. Um, you know, I'm open to hear any additions or changes. Um, but I would like to have somebody actually make a motion to approve the agenda uh, as it stands for the uh, for the meeting today. We could have uh, somebody from our group. Okay, got somebody here. All right, Peter and uh, okay, great. All right, so we've got that. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move forward. Uh, we're also going to use the uh, agenda and, of course, obviously, the electronic meeting format. It's kind of goes without saying. Okay. Uh, one of the first items that I have to disclose and we have to discuss is our uh, budget uh, audited financial reports from 2021. Um, this is the audited financial report. As it stood, we had uh, income of uh, 717000 
thousand euros. Uh, we had expenses, obviously, of, that were greater, uh, which is you know fine. We're not for profit. Um, you know, you can see that there was a bit of a loss there, which is not unexpected since we were doing a lot of work with uh, fits and so on. Um, we had cash uh, on the balance sheet and then also total receivables. So, uh, you know, our liquid assets right now are a little over a, a half a million, uh, or, yeah, a half a million uh, euro. And you can see that where some of the uh, expenses were in fits area and also in the marketing activities that were going on. All right. This office is obviously the business office. There wasn't much travel, obviously. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, the budget or the, the uh, finances for 2021. Uh, those were audited by our auditor, uh, Michelle Wera, uh, who audits our books every year, working with our accounting firm. So uh, this is the auditor's letter that basically says everything's in order. Um, and as a result, uh, I guess what I would like to do is ask for an approval of the uh, 2021. You can use the uh, raise your hand feature. Okay, I guess uh, we've got that. Katie, can you see that actually? Because I've got a couple of them in here. Yes, I've got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on. Uh, the next topic here is around uh, uh, the uh, vote to elect board members. Uh, the only board member that we've actually got to approve today uh, as a result of this meeting is our Yokogawa representative. Uh, the other ones all are in standing uh, for another term for another year. Uh, and then, of course, Rockwell Automation uh, very recently here just had a change uh, of their board member. Uh, we're waiting to hear from Rockwell. I actually uh, wrote uh, them an email uh, because Lee actually left uh, very quickly. Uh, I, I, so kind of left us hanging a little bit. Uh, but I did actually send an email to uh, Blake Moret, their uh, CEO, to find out what they'd like to do with this. So I don't have an answer to that yet. So we're not going to vote on that position. Uh, but we do need to vote on the Yokogawa one. So anyway, uh, what I'd like to do is, you know, get an approval to go ahead and move forward with that. Uh, again, we'll read out these votes at the end of this uh, section. Um, okay. In terms of uh, moving forward with 2022, and this is gonna lead up to talking about the budget for 2022, we've got a number of activities that are occurring in the marketing area uh, where we've done some new messaging and so on. We're working in our ecosystem partner program, uh, marketing activities, and then just uh, providing enablement tools, I would say, for our member companies, things like brochures and developing web developer webinars and so on. Uh, there's a number of technology activities going on. Uh, this is a very high level overview. Saria will go over this later in some of the informational sections. Uh, we've also focused on standards and associations. These are references to uh, organizations that we also have connections with uh, in our organization. And as a result, this is the budget that we've created for fiscal uh, 2022, okay? So what we're looking at is uh, one of the biggest changes, I guess I'd say, would be actually from, uh, and you can see the comparison there, from the budget in 2021, much of the thing that we had to manage through, and I, I got involved towards the end, was that the, the licensing fees, some of the things were actually lower than expected. Um, I'm not showing the actuals here, uh, but I'm just showing the budget over budget, uh, year over year. So again, membership dues, very close certification income, you know, a lot of these things are very close, all right, to what happened last year. A uh, few more uh, items on the licensing side. From an administration standpoint, you know, we think our, our uh, administration costs will be a little less. We are gonna spend more money on travel uh, next this year, all right, I plan on that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm living proof of that right now in Hanover. Uh, technology, we think we'll spend a little bit less. Uh, standards and associations, we think we'll spend a little bit more. And then our marketing, we think we'll spend a little bit more than we had in the budget. All right, so our emphasis is gonna be on communications of our message 
and then actually getting out and, and doing a little bit more work in the field. Okay, so we'll, we'll spend just a little bit more money. Um, and you can see what the net operating profit or loss would be from those activities. Um, and then we've got in, information on the non-operating revenue. We'll continue to invest in FITs. We've got some other things that Soria wants to do with the team uh, that we'll continue to spend money on. So clearly our total net operating loss at the bottom there, you can see is going to be pretty close to break even, all right, which is kind of where we eventually want to be. So with that, um, you know, one of the things I'm going to ask for is a, a vote. Now, this is kind of interesting because this is in our bylaws, and I have to be frank with you. The board has already approved this a, a budget back in January. So we're six months into the year. This is a bit of a compulsory thing, um, but it needs to be approved by the General Assembly because we're an organization for you. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, the board has already approved this agenda so, or this uh, budget. So anyway. I'll uh, leave it at that. You can cast your votes uh, as we as we go forward here, and uh, we'll get the results towards the end. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one last thing I just want to mention from the business office is this idea of the test center audits. Uh, we've got five centers that have all been audited. They're all up to speed. Uh, this is our letter from our auditor. Uh, basically says that uh, everything's in good standing. Two do have some follow-ups that are required, which are in process. I don't anticipate any problems. But again, I guess it's good and it's nice to know that uh, the test centers are all uh, good, okay? All right, with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Paul uh, from Procter & Gamble. And Paul, I actually had a chance to meet Paul and actually see part of his presentation uh, at the ODBA meeting out in San Diego a few months back. And it really struck me in some of the things that Paul talked about, about some of the challenges that he has, and I think other users have, uh, when it comes to dealing with intelligent devices, uh, especially, you know, in some cases, I'll call them disparate <laughs> uh, devices, you know, uh, not all process, maybe a lot of process, maybe some discrete, different networks, you know, IO link, hard, things like that. How do people deal with that? And, and what kind of issues are they dealing with? Uh, so anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and uh, let him talk about his, uh, experiences and his perspective. Paul? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Let me get my uh, the right monitor up here. Yeah, so um, this presentation is a slimmed down version of a presentation that I gave at the ODBA uh, meeting uh, a few months ago. And it and the reason I gave that presentation at the ODVA meeting was because of some work, some test work that I'll uh, allude to here in the presentation. Um, I I'm, I'm, uh, have slimmed this down some uh, for for time. Uh, the full ODVA presentation is available if you if you want to subject yourself to the video uh, through the ODVA website, uh, and it's on uh, Vimeo as well. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm not showing you my video this morning because I can't blur my background and go to meeting and my uh, my home setting is, is not the most professional, shall we say. Um, I've been with uh, Procter & Gamble for 36 years. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer by training and education. My focus areas in the company have, uh, have consistently been in process automation and control, control loop performance and tuning, uh, pro and process instrumentation. And I'm also uh, kind of the de facto community manager of P&G's internal uh, automation and control global community. So um, I'll first start with a, a few observations of today's kind of process instrumentation network. So today, for the most part, conventional I.O. dominates, but it is highly distributed. And for us today, it has an Ethernet backbone. That's part of kind of the theme of, of Ethernet uh, taking over. Um, we have a lot of discrete devices, simply on-off type. Uh, and because at Procter & Gamble, we have a broad variety of businesses, from a few that are heavy process automation to, you know, we make a lot of 
uh, products, but then also we put a lot of those products in bottles and boxes and bags. So we have a, a heavy presence in packaging. And then also we make discrete products in uh, diapers and feminine care products and things like that. So we have a, a, a broad application of devices across the process and the uh, more the factory automation parts of our businesses. Um, we have part is broadly available for analog devices, but frankly, even though it's been around for 25 years, really has not been uh, highly leveraged, I would say, in our business. And that may be in common with others. That's been, uh, that's probably widely variable across the industry. As we look going forward and you know, what's been going on, Ethernet's becoming more and more important. It's the backbone of remote I.O. It is the interface to devices like drives of all kinds, whether those be uh, variable frequency drives or servos. Um, and it has emerged in recent years for complex multivariable instruments, like Coriolis flow meters, uh, pH transmitters being two examples. And those are typically on like private isolated networks, so 192.168.1.xxx type networks. Um, so what's going on in that, in our uh, kind of our process instrumentation layer is we have smarter devices with more data to share. So all kinds of devices are getting smarter they're embodying higher levels of or different types of diagnostics um, and multivariable devices are becoming more uh, common and there are more systems that want that data maintenance the uh, proverbial data analytics uh, kind of devices want that data so that's also kind of driving continued penetration of ethernet farther down in the architecture but there are some, some real disadvantages or uh, lack of functionality in, I would say, you know, IT classical Ethernet. Uh, here are a few of those um, that, that are really important to the process industry. So one is uh, fragility of wiring. Uh, we've had circumstances where we had Ethernet wiring in a field panel that uh, you know, somebody um, you know, they bent it too tightly, they exceeded the bend radius, damaged the cable to the point where we started having uh, spurious occasional shutdowns. And of course, uh, you know, those are, are challenging to, uh, to really identify. Uh, we, we'd really like to have longer distance wiring without fiber. Um, loop power is something that's always important. We we like to have four, uh, we like two wire devices. So where we have signal and power on the same wire as opposed to four wire devices, which would, which really requires a separate power uh, provision. And then um, not so much, but occasionally in Procter & Gamble's business, we need to deal in uh, working in electrically classified areas. Uh, and that's that's something that uh, conventional Ethernet can't get into. So all of these factors, you know, were in part, you know, part of the development of uh, the advanced physical layer specification emerging, uh, which is which is now, uh, you know, the standards are all published. The the equipment is really not quite available yet, but uh, we embarked as long as 18 months ago on a path to do a test in our facility of APL technology, which is a two wire twisted pair 10 megabit ethernet, which also provides power. Uh, pretty good stuff. We did the test. I'll show you kind of the results of that. That uh, kind of pointed up uh, the kind of some of the issues that I want to discuss with you today. And if you want a little more uh, about that test, uh, I would refer you to the ODBA presentation. Um, we've also, uh, you know, 
been exploring uh, IO Lane very actively. And, uh, and that is both in our kind of more in our factory automation side of our business, as well as uh, appearing more in the process instrumentation side. So we said we'd do a, a test. Well, where would we do that test? Well, we have this facility in our uh, lab in Cincinnati, which we refer to as the Smart Process Cell or the SPC. Uh, it's located in our corporate engineering technology lab. Uh, just outside Cincinnati. It's, um, you know, as you can see from the picture, it's a fairly good sized skid. It has four tanks in it of uh, 500 and 375 kilos in size. There are six pumps with flow meters that uh, move water around the skid. And this is, allows us to run a combination of continuous and batch operations here. So we can do three unit batching as well as full continuous operations. Uh, our process fluid is water. This system is uh, fully self-contained. That is, there's nothing going to the drain and nothing feeding externally. And uh, it, it was incredibly fortunate that pre-COVID, we um, went through the procedures to allow us to run this unit remotely. Initially, it was to remote run it from our, our office area in the same building um, where we'd have multiple monitors and, and, and ability to do some other, uh, some of our work more efficiently than if we had to be back in the lab. Uh, turned out it really didn't matter if I was sitting in my office in the building or if I was sitting uh, in the home office, kind of where I am right now. So that allowed us to do uh, you know, a tremendous amount of work with this system, which we use as a demonstration and exploration and software development system. Uh, we were able to keep doing that during COVID. Uh, it's been a, a tremendous asset for us. So our network, you know, before we made, uh, you know, kind of our more recent changes, you know, our, uh, kind of looked like this. So we sit behind a um, um, ICS firewall and we have a controller with some conventional IO and then a distributed IO network, some remote IO. We have uh, ethernet flow meters uh, and this, uh, we're using ethernet IP here. We have Ethernet load cells. We have load cells on the batching system, uh, all of our variable frequency drives. Uh, and we had uh, one IO link flow meter when we started. It's kind of an experiment for us. Uh, initially, when, when the system, when the uh, whole SPC went into service. And then we have kind of our uh, uh, computer stack. Uh, this runs in a, uh, in a virtual machine environment. So we have, HMI servers, historian, batch server, and engineering station. So changes that we made um, starting roughly a year ago, and then following the, uh, I guess, the Akama demonstration of APL, uh, we were able to working, you know, in a in a public way with several partners, do a couple of things. One is, uh, if you see down here in the bottom left corner, we installed an APL switch and in our field panel, and we have uh, two APL radar level transmitters, a pressure transmitter, and a temperature transmitter. Those all work. Uh, those are all Ethernet IP devices running on APL. And uh, generally speaking, we're uh, we're very happy with uh, with what we've seen from, from that technology, uh, it works. Now the devices are all prototypes and have, uh, so they're rough around the edges. We'll talk about that in just a little bit here as well. Then uh, we put in a broad variety of IO link devices. Um, and in part that was because we had, uh, we frankly had some leftover budget money and uh, decided that would be an interesting thing to try. And uh, so we bought a lot of uh, IO link devices from a variety of suppliers and uh, kind of installed them. Everything from uh, 
temperature and pressure measurement devices added to our existing flow meter, a, an IO-Link radar level device, uh, low-level switches, and some uh, smart uh, on-off valve controllers. So as we, we've really um, learned quite a bit about these smart devices and um, in working both with, in working with APL and Ethernet IP, in working with our IO link devices, and in working with kind of more conventionally wired Ethernet uh, IP devices. So kind of coming out of this experience, and we had uh, you know a few hiccups along the way. Um, it, uh, it it really pointed out. You know, as I said, some of those hiccups. So, so what do users, I think, really need going forward with these uh, smarter devices, more complex devices? And this potentially includes uh, everything from an IO link or potentially an Ethernet IP push button or pilot light or uh, satellite, that's a very uh, kind of attractive device, all the way up to the Coriolis flow meters that we've had on Ethernet IP here for a while. So really what I'd like to ask the community for, whether this be the vendors, the um, standards developers, the suppliers, the systems suppliers, we're going to need help managing complexity. So, you know, I'll go into this in a little more detail, but kind of the, the primary tools that an ENI tech needs today doing maintenance in this kind of environment really needs their hand tools, their digital voltmeter, and maybe a hard communicator. Um, well, when we start to look at these, um, these other devices, these smarter devices, they have a lot more intelligence. There's a lot of attraction to more of these uh, Ethernet IP and APL and IO link devices. What do users run into? Well, we run into a whole different set of technologies. So we've got to assign IP addresses in an Ethernet environment. So now we're dealing really in the field with BOOP or with DHCP. How do you? do that. In an I.O. link environment, you've got to deal with IODD files, uh, EDS files in an Ethernet and P environment. There are, potent, there are potentially in these devices multiple profiles that could uh, change the data model uh, that the device provides. And these devices are, you know, as they get smarter, they also have things like firmware revisions and releases. They are, um, each one is almost a little computer kind of on their own. So a couple of examples maybe, uh, or a, an analogy or a, an application that, uh, that might bring home a, a few of these things. And particularly if any of you are, uh, you know, gaming enthusiasts, for example. Um, Here's just a few examples of the world of Logitech mice for Windows. Now, if you want to get beyond the world of Logitech, there is an incredible variety of mice and pointing devices available. But just to limit our scope a little bit, let's stay with Logitech. And for instance, here is the really inexpensive two button and a scroll wheel wired mouse, okay, less than $10. Uh, the next step up might be this wireless device, still dealing with two buttons and a scroll wheel, but now I've got a wireless connection. Uh, we step to the bottom left corner here, this little uh, lavender mouse, uh, it's kind of a, a, a favorite. Um, why is it different? Well, it's got this little button here, behind the scroll wheel, this calls up your custom emoji menu. And, you know, you know I, I like my emojis as much as anybody else of my generation, not as much as many people of younger generations. But um, 
my uh, my colleagues at work actually bought me one of these after I came back from doing this presentation at ODBA, so sitting on my desk at the office. Then up here, you can see we have, this is a, a very business-oriented mouse, but you can see it starts to have some other kind of features. There are some, some other kind of wheels over here on the right side, another button here. And then we start really getting into the gaming environment. This uh, big one in the bottom center here, this has 15 configurable gaming-oriented functions, 15. This one uh, over on the right, uh, it only has 11, but it's ambidextrous. So it, it can be used by somebody with their left hand. It could be, a, could be a big deal for some. All right, so why am I going into the world of mice? Well, it's, uh, it's really about how do you do device replacement? So um, we think about replacing a mouse. As a user, say I remove my old wired mouse and I put in a, uh, a wireless mouse. So I plug in, say, a receiver or maybe it's Bluetooth, connect the new mouse, wait, Windows is doing something behind the curtain, and hey, I'm going to use my new mouse. Well, if it's this simple, what happened? What is Windows doing here? It's losing a connection to the old device. It kind of sees a new pointing device, and then it may, you know, if it finds an appropriate driver, fine, but doesn't find an appropriate driver, it may reach out to the internet, something our controllers probably are not going to do, to find out. Installs that new driver. Again, are our controllers going to install a new driver all by themselves? Tell you it's done, and happily you can go on and use your new mouse. What if things get a little more complicated? So I've been using my, you know, my favorite uh, lavender uh, emoji mouse here for a while, and it dies, and I don't have a replacement. I can just find this basic, you know, two-button wireless. I connect that. It works. It gives me the basics of the mouse, but I've lost my emoji menu. Even if everything you know works well behind the scenes and we get the right driver and everything, I've lost that. Well, what if this is even more of a challenge? What if I'm a, a, a gamer and I've been using this 15 button highly customized mouse to you know blow away whatever aliens of the particular variety are in my first person shooter? And I can and I this is the one that I can find, this, this, uh, this other mouse. Well, even if everything happens well behind the scenes, I can use that new mouse, but I've lost my 15 button configurations. So I've got to go reallocate those, move those around, reset the new one. I've got a lot of work that I've got to do. So how does this kind of, you know, maybe uh, analogous to something in the industrial environment? Well, what about today's task of replacing a four to 20 milliamp hard pressure transmitter? So what happens in the field? So, uh, and let's say I'm doing this at three o'clock on Sunday morning and it's my shift E and I trying to get the system back up and working. So you're gonna remove the old device, install a new transmitter, which might be from the same company that made it, but might be from a different company, depends on what was available in the storeroom. Uh, what do you have to do? Well, I've gotta do some configuration on that transmitter to match what the old one was. Maybe I configure the range. Um, you know, I'm wiring it to the same set of wires but I've got to configure the range. If I was doing some, some real hard leveraging, I might need to go configure the PV, SV, TV, QV, extra variables, things like that. And this probably works. And I can probably do this in the field with my hand tools, my digital voltmeter, and my, uh, my heart communicator, stuff that I, 
you know, we've been using for 20, 25 years. So what happens uh, in the application or in the controller? Well, the application, the controller loses the connection. You know, there's an alarm, maybe, maybe the process keeps running, maybe it's down, depending on the, the uh, criticality of this device. I've got a valid connection to a new device. It's, it's now sees a device wired to the same set of wires. Check the scaling. I've got a valid signal. I may not have to do anything on the application or the controller side to do this replacement. Okay. What if I'm now replacing a smart device, an Ethernet IP device, maybe on APL, an IO link device? I remove the old device. If I wire the new transmitter, I've got a whole host of other things now that I've got to worry about. So I lose connection to the old device. I can wire up the new device, maybe in the same spot. Um, does the new device communicate? That's a real serious question. Do I have a new configuration file for this device? Um, unless it is exactly the same device that I took out all the way down to the firmware revision level. This is an open question. Do I have a new configuration file, whether that is an EDS file for an Ethernet IP environment or an IODD file for an, Ethernet, for a, a, an IO link environment? And, and how do I get that file or that information to the controller? And do I have to get to the programming environment for the controller in order to do that? So I've, I'm now someplace other than in the field with my hand tools and my heart communicator. So I've got a whole nother set of skills. Potentially, do I have to restart or reload the controller to make this change? And then is the data structure the same? If the device I put in is not made by the previous by the maker of the previous device I pulled out, this is almost certain to be different, this data structure. So do I have to change my application code? Uh, even if it is device made by the same manufacturer, they may have changed the data structure. They may have conveniently added some more capability or you know, if it's not exactly the same device. And it's really an open question of, is this gonna work? And how long is it going to take to restore my system from in operation? And if this happens at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning, and I can't get knowledgeable resources involved until, say, opening a business on Monday morning, that's not going to happen very many times before management's going to insist on something different. Okay. So kind of where some of these barriers lie, well, communications at the basic level is clearly one. Uh, IP address assignment is too hard uh, today. It's too hard for the vast majority of Ethernet IP devices conventionally wired that we've dealt with, but also was not uh, particularly easy in, uh, in our APL discussion. So, Am I using boot P? Am I using DHCP? Um, am I using a local display? Dip switches. I've broken dip switches on brand new devices. Um, it's just, they're small. You never have exactly the right size screwdriver. Um, you have selector wheels. And all of these, for instance, you know, they, they could be assuming, you know, a lot of them assume well, it's going to be somewhere, I'm going to setting the last octet in 192.168.1.x. That may not be a valid assumption for much longer as our networks continue to evolve and change. In the, uh, in the setup of our APL demonstration and in our initial bench test work, uh, I personally bricked, turned into bricks, 
uh, three prototype APL devices that were sent to us uh, in, in the span of trying to set up communications and assign IP addresses and get them to work. So uh, while I give those, I, those uh, prototype devices some grace for being prototype devices, it really highlights that uh, you know this initial configure communication configuration is a big headache for us, and uh, it's it's going to get worse. It, I can see it getting worse going forward, where it needs to get better. And consider, for instance, that I'm pulling a, a let's say this is a proximity switch or an optic detector. Um, we use a lot of those certainly in our factory automation side. Uh, it's a simple device today. You can pull it out, put it back in. It doesn't matter whose it is as long as it wires the same. Um, when that turns into a smart device, and we have seen those turning into smart devices very much today, we have those uh, where the device not only gives you is there something there or not, but it tells you what the signal strength is when there's not something there. And as it gets dirty, that signal strength goes down and you can send an alert to the operator to say, go clean that switch before it gets blocked completely. So you can see there's a real reliability, availability kind of advantage to some of those devices. But when that thing breaks and I have to go replace it, is it gonna communicate that we've got to uh, spend some, some serious effort worrying about and we want some help from our suppliers, or standards makers, or vendors. So this, you know, integration and compatibility of EDS files, IODD files. How do we handle all these? And we really need easy replacement of like-for-like -like devices. Um, you know, if it's just a different firmware version, the same device, is that going to cost me? hours getting the right people with the right knowledge to the system to uh, get that system up and running. So what are these skills going to be needed to troubleshoot and repair our smart systems? And then as an end user operator, how do we make sure those, uh, those skills are available when we need them? Okay. Another thing that's come up for us is this uh, and this is a little closer to your FTT mission, is this issue of configuration confusion. So uh, it's, it's not a joke, but it could be, of how many ways are there to change the configuration of a smart pressure transmitter, or a Coriolis meter, temperature device, whatever, okay? Well, I can think of at least five, and say this is an APL device or an Ethernet IP device, there's typically a local display, there could be a fuel communicator, there's controller programming software, there may be an asset management system, an FDT frame application. I have on my SPC a, uh, a Pactware 5 implementation available. Uh, and with most of these devices, uh, certainly if it's an, an Ethernet or a, an APL device, it's got a web interface. At least five places. Do all these interfaces show the same information? Do they all agree what the configuration is in the transmitter? And unfortunately, the answer today is no. It's very easy for them to be different. And in fact, uh, it's very easy from for the user to kind of unknowingly download or overwrite a configuration with the configuration that may be not the right one. So it's a real question point of confusion for us of who has the master copy or the golden copy, who's got the right configuration. Um, enough said about that for the time being. Well, an example, a very real example that we've had uh, with Ethernet IP Coriolis flow meters. Um, we have you know, made configuration changes in the field during a um, 
you know, a startup or a qualification scenario. So the simplest one to think about is we're changing like the filter time on a flow signal. Okay. Well, at the end of the day, uh, the integrator during the startup has made some changes that require the controller to be uh, reloaded. Uh, when they reload the controller, the controller conveniently downloads and overwrites all of those Ethernet IP field devices, and we lost the changes that we carefully made the previous day to all like those filter settings. And we keep wondering, why does this keep getting reset? Why does it keep getting reset? It's just a waste of time and a source of confusion. Okay. So uh, where are we headed? Well, we are headed in these, uh, in our kind of our process instrumentation or field layer networks, we are headed toward getting, I think, more complicated and smarter and more capable uh, devices. Um, it's stuff, there's probably stuff headed, if not for cloud, for edge. I've shown in this, uh, this afternoon here, you know, a, a separate kind of maintenance connection here um, to a maintenance device from this network. So that, that could be some kind of an, an edge collecting device or something like that. Because there's a lot of this information that exists now in these smarter devices in the field layer network that the controller doesn't need to do its, uh, its basic uh, control second to second, minute to minute, hour to hour control capability. And plowing all that information through the controller is going to cost us money. It's going to require larger controllers or uh, more engineering effort, putting those control configurations together. So, uh, you know, there's going to be some incentive for changing these network configurations or adding edge devices for all this other kind of information. So you can see these our networks becoming potentially uh, less controller centric. Um, there are going to be a proliferation of protocols all running kind of on this Ethernet backbone. And uh, uh, as users, you know, we're going to need standards. Uh, a lot of those are uh, some are available now and others are continuing to develop. And, and get deployed. Uh, APL is coming. You know, IOLink is here. IOLink continues to expand. Um, things are changing. We don't know exactly how they're changing. So to kind of wrap up here and allow time for a few questions, um, new technologies need to deliver functionality and simplicity. So we really would like to have a, 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 a kind of a complete set, you know, elegant solutions as opposed to just solutions that deliver whiz bang capability, but impose then some technology burdens on us. Standards are great. We love standards and uh, multi-vendor uh, activities. They uh, really help end users, but we need from from all kind of the developers and the standards organizations and the users to consider these various scenarios that the end users have to deal with when creating and managing standards and products and interfaces. Uh, think about not only the people who engineer these products up front but the people who take care of them, the people who maintain them, the people that have to troubleshoot them. And uh, you know, my friend, the uh, e &I technician at uh, 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning. So, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take whatever questions we have in the time available. I hope, Steve, that was uh, fit, fit my time. Yeah, you did great. You did great. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, and you, you were like a Swiss train. You finished right on time, so it's perfect. Um, hey, a couple questions though for Paul, and actually they came in on the chat. Uh, one of them was around relative to the EDS uh, files. 
And the question is uh, actually from uh, Cristobal Ruiz. He says, uh, did you have to download the EDS files from a website or could you download them from the devices? For the most part, um, devices come with the EDS file on the device so you can get it from the device. Um, and from the prototypes, that was you know a, a, a little different. You know, we had the, got the EDS devices uh, differently uh, for some of those. But um, regardless of whether it's kind of on the device or whether I need to go on a network to get that kind of driver, uh, the I think the one of the points that I'd like not to lose is that. I still have to somehow ingest that device into the controller. And today that really requires, uh, you know, it requires me to get into the programming environment. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, well, and one other question here um, from uh, Cristobal, uh, Cristobal is, uh, he thanks you for your presentation. He was curious if you looked at radius for network switch management and device management. We're we're looking at yeah you know, we've seen some interesting things on the on the switch side. Um, one of the things that was in one of the prototype APL switches that we saw was, for example, uh, I believe it was port based DHCP. So you could configure in the switch that when you get a DHCP request on this particular port, this is the IP address that you assign. Mm -hmm. So DHCP done at the switch level, at the port level. That seems like a, a, a potentially very useful approach to the how do I assign IP addresses to these devices. But it kind of it requires that A, your switch support that, and also that the device that you get, um, you know, will will take that DHCP. Okay, great, great, great. And one last question here is what what were the uh, average distances between your field devices uh, and the APL switch or the IO link master? Well, as you could see from our our skid, uh, that you know our stuff is all very short, so. I'd say none of our wires are longer than about 20 meters. You know, the APL standard goes to 200 meters for standard drops and under other circumstances, I believe to a thousand meters. Mm -hmm. So the distances in APL are really one of its great advantages over more conventional ethernet. Um, we considered buying a spool of, uh, of wire and, you know, putting it in the middle uh, between the switch and the device, uh, we didn't. We, frankly, we didn't want to go spend the thousand dollars plus to go buy that spool, but <laughs> we thought about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Thanks. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, I don't have any other questions here right now uh, on the chat. I don't see them. So, uh, Paul, I want to thank you very much again for your time, uh, your preparation. I know you had to make some changes from the ODBA presentation. But I thought it was great and uh, kind of to the point. So uh, again, we appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Paul. By the way, has to head out, but you know, feel free uh, to uh, connect with him after if you're interested with any other uh, questions or discussions. So again, thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. Okay, great. Hey, we're gonna get back with the rest of the meeting, but before we do that, uh, what I want to do is make sure that everybody uh, completes their voting. Uh, we have two people that have actually started the voting but didn't finish. Uh, maybe there's a technical problem. Maybe I don't. I don't know what. Uh, but please make sure that you vote for all the topics that have come up so far, uh, because this will be the last chance to record your vote um, as we go forward as we finish the next section here. So we'll be reading out the votes here in a little bit. All right. So please get the voting completed. And if you have any kind of an issue, throw that in the chat box, and uh, we'll get it taken care of. All right. Uh, so with that, what I'd like to do is get back to the um, agenda at hand here. Yeah, and so 
one of the things that I wanted to do is make sure that everybody was level set on what the whole idea of the FDT3 spec was and what I'm we were referring to now as the unified environment. Um, one of the reasons we, we, we came up with the unified environment uh, name um, was that, you know, I think people know FTT, it's been around for over, what, 20 years. Um, you know, it's an IEC standard. Um, the after one of these days, I'll actually really remember it, but it's uh, IEC 62453. Pretty good from memory. It only takes a few days here. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been around. But, but, you know, it's a little bit more than that now, I think. I mean, it's a standard that enables, I think, some of the things that perhaps and provides the foundation for some of the areas that Paul talked about um, in terms of trying to figure out ways to make to manage intelligent devices and not just process devices but also discrete device devices hence kind of the unified piece all right uh, also is network agnostic and it's also uh, uh, device type in some respects agnostic we have ways to ingest other types of device types into FDT, uh, again, makes it universal from that standpoint. So it clearly is kind of this universal standard that works across multiple technologies from a network standpoint, multiple multiple protocols, uh, truly makes it universal and supports both process and discrete devices. So again, you know, what we're talking about here is how do we meet the user's needs, enable digital transformation, uh, up things for FDT3, and then there are some benefits, I think, along the way uh, that FTT3 can. From a user standpoint, as I mentioned, you know, process, hybrid, discrete applications. It's an open standard. Uh, it's very data centric in terms of being able to uh, configure and collect data. Uh, and provides a very flexible architecture that's secure and uh, it's compatible, as I mentioned, with many different types of networking technologies. Um, it's a standard for enabling the integrated design, configuration, operation, and maintenance of control systems. Uh, and I think that's at the root of what's going on. And I think it does address some of the issues that Paul brought up uh, in terms of enabling, or at least providing the core to do that. Um, some of the use cases that were part of the development were the ability to do mobility. You know, Paul talked about having the, the, uh, the handheld well, you know, the handheld could be done on a tablet or the handheld could be done on a, a phone. So it might be. So one of the things that FDT3 spec defined was how mobility was to be handled. The other thing was around security because that's kind of an issue, uh, especially, you know, with all the cybersecurity as we move into the Ethernet and other types of technologies, we open a lot of things up and, and create a lot of uh, uh, possible areas for uh, challenges. And then, of course, the whole concept of FDT Hub. So Paul talked about how, you know, having basically device parameters and device descriptions stored someplace, uh, maybe being able to make it easier to go ahead and replace a device. The whole concept of the hub that actually stored the DTMs and the, the certified DTMs, so that when somebody plugged on a, a device, it would effectively go off and kind of find its DTM. Very much in the background like the printer driver does or the uh the the the, the mouse example uh, but but the place to store all the the collection of information required for the device itself right so the dtm repository all certified dtms would be on the hub and that hub wherever the user would like to have it in the control system uh, you know a lot of references to the cloud is it on premise is it wherever it's it's the hub and we can decide where we want to put that. Again, the specification calls out for how the interaction of those things should work. Uh, but again, it, it's up to the manufacturers to actually use the specification to users with the features, some of them of which Paul just talked about that he'd like to see. Um, there's been a technology evolution. Obviously, FDT, and you all know this way better than I do. It's been around for 20 years. I'm kind of the new guy here. Uh, but, you know, clearly 1.2 is accepted and used in millions of in installs. I would say that from my experience, FTT2 doesn't seem to be adopted very well for a number of different reasons. It probably didn't add a lot of other connections, although it did provide, you know, for OPC UA at the time. Uh, it did have a set of common components. 
uh, and you know, did some things, uh, some things from a security standpoint, but not as in, in, as good as FTT3 does. So you can see some of the things there that are enabled now by FTT3, all right, with the uh, encryption, the uh, application connection, the mobility, as I mentioned, and also the FTT hub. All right, and those are kind of the enhancements today. I had somebody stop by the booth today, quite frankly, from one of the uh, larger valve manufacturing companies and said, geez, you know, what's going on with FTT3? Uh, you know, FTT2 was not accepted very well. Doesn't seem like there was a lot of pickup. I mean, it's just the feedback I got. And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> it's a new day. Uh, FTT3, I think, will find, will provide a lot of value from a particular use case perspective, uh, perhaps more and be adopted more because users will want to have those features um, as part of their control system solutions. Again, all industry networks and standards in terms of uh, uh, connections. And then in terms of you know, empowering the intelligent enterprise, these are just a number of the things that are going on and that people are looking for uh, and, and that the specification enables, all right, around um, the web client-based, you know, information-driven, service-oriented, and uh, so on. In terms of different digital transformation, you know, really what we're trying to do here is actually have FTT help in the journey to basically connect from the sensor to the cloud. Uh, and the whole concept of FTT UE kind of creates this ecosystem uh, that allows for a distributed architecture uh, from either you know the desktop for a single user. Uh, DTM for any device, server for multiple devices uh, or multiple users, I should say, uh, and so on. So, you know, again, providing the tool set and the specification of the tools to go ahead and uh, enable that whole sensor to cloud connection. You know, these are the components. Um, what's interesting is I actually uh, had a chance to view this all in operation this week at Hanover. Uh, it was very good. Thomas Hedlich did a great job actually putting together our demo system to show how all these elements actually work together, uh, along with, uh, you know, some of the other manufacturers that provided products uh, so we could create and put together a system to demonstrate effectively the server um, and demonstrate the, uh, the web server, uh, the OPC server, and even uh, with our friends at FlowServe, we were able to show custom applications. Uh, and kind of that whole custom uh, service value added where they could add their unique value to what was involved and available from the FDT3 uh, DTMs uh, and so on. So it was uh, kind of nice to see it all come together. Um, so, you know, these are the things that we looked at and we actually demonstrated at the show. Uh, and uh, it was it was just good, like as I mentioned, to see it all kind of come together and, uh, and uh, be real and not just talking about it in PowerPoint. PowerPoint's always easy, right? Trying to actually make it all work together is always something else. But uh, I think the organization's done a great job, and it's really been able to create a set of uh, a standard and a set of tools that actually work together and uh, can be put together and uh, used by our systems manufacturers and our device uh, members. Okay. And of course, as I mentioned, the FTT hub, I think this may address uh, some of Paul's needs, uh, again, or at least provide the foundation, which would be good to go ahead and actually see how we can make this work uh, and see if it actually does address any of the concerns or the, the issues that, that Paul brought up uh, as just one example of why the FTT hub was created. All right. In terms of uh, development, you know, basically what we've got are the common components, all right, uh, that are available. So there's the FTT server common component, the desktop common component, uh, components, all right. Um, we're obviously uh, have OPC UA integrated uh, into the FTT server. In fact, uh, some of the folks from the FTT or the OPC organization this week at the show mentioned that, you know, it's really important that perhaps we make a bigger thing about that. Three, and they actually use the FTT server, they get OPC UA as part of that. I mean, it's it's integral. You don't need another license. You don't need to do anything. It just comes as part of it, all right? Um, and 
got a development environment that uh, allows for customization uh, as we go forward here. In terms of business benefits, uh, there's a number of things, and I mentioned this before, it's really driving towards the IT and OT integration, uh, being able to go ahead and communicate and, and seamlessly transfer information from the SCID uh, all the way to the network or to the cloud. So kind of that true sensor to cloud integration that's enabled by uh, the configuration, uh, the devices using the specification, the DTMs, the server, um, and so on. Uh, in terms of from a device supplier standpoint, you know, basically you're providing uh, a connection that's uh, platform independent uh, OPC UA server is like I mentioned pre-wired. So as a device maker, you have an automatic connection. It allows you to go ahead and share your device data um, across the enterprise as required. Uh, and you've actually get more value as part of a system that actually is more data intensive and uh, robust from that standpoint. So, you know, look, part of what we talked about is having digital transformation, how FDT may help, help that. And look, the one way that it's going to happen from an end user standpoint is that. You know, if they request the system uh, and device vendors to build and design products that reference the FTT3 spec, you know, that'll actually help along that journey because of the inherent setup and of the specification and the related tools. Um, for a system and device manufacturers, it's real simple. You need to sign the collaboration agreement and obtain the style guide and the tool sets to go ahead and do developments. Now, I understand. You may not want to do that until your customer asks, but I'll tell you right now, we've got a couple pilots that are set up that are going to start. I anticipate we'll have more because FDT3 and the specification and the tools actually enable meeting some of the needs that customers are asking for besides what they typically have gotten in the past. All right. So to see the real benefits of FDT3, I think it's going to take us to getting a few installs going here and, uh, and seeing how that works. All right. So with that, uh, I will uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, keep moving here with our agenda and move over to uh, some of our other uh, informational proceedings. Uh, Katie, I'm just going to ask here: Do we have any uh, information relative to any voting things yet before we move on? Yeah, it looks like everything is in, and we are ready to show the results. Okay, why don't we do that before we do the informational proceedings? Okay. Do you want me to? There we go. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so the agenda was approved. Great, thank you for that. Yep, and as you can see here, we had a, a couple additional. Um, people join in after we took the original um, okay. head count. So we've got a few additional votes here. Okay. The financial report, okay, was approved. Great, thank you. And I realize this is a little out of order, I mean, in terms of the agenda, but we're, we're going, that's fine, okay. Uh, we had one abstain, uh, no vote on the board members. Otherwise, we did have that approved. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, the program budget and okay, great. All right, approve that. Thank you. All right, and that's it for now. That's it. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. All right, let's uh, switch over to the informational proceedings. I think it's just important now that we've got everybody together uh, with the General Assembly meeting here that we hear what's going on from the standards and associations area, also the technology area, and then we'll give you a little insight in some of the marketing activities and then we will call for an adjournment of the meeting. So uh, with that, let's uh, switch it over to Shannon. And again, if you have any questions as this goes on, feel free to type those into the, uh, the question or the chat box there. All right. You are unmuted. Okay, great. So it sounds uh, like you can hear me. I can hear you. We can see your entire desktop. 
Okay, that's what I was wondering. So when it made me presenter, it did not let me choose which monitor to show. Hmm. Let me. I'm gonna. Uh, let me just switch my monitors then. Okay, you're getting there. That's pretty good. So you're still seeing presenter view, not the slide view. Katie, can you see that? Yes, it's still in presenter view, Shannon. Yeah. If we have to, we might have to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try it this way. There we go. Yeah, I know what I need to do. I need to switch my primary and secondary monitors. Shannon, you can change that setting in PowerPoint. Oh, I know what you're talking about, Paul. The little thingy at the top that says switch the views. There you go. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. And we'll start from slide two, because I think uh, we've uh, used enough time that we know we're getting ready for the standards <laughs> and associations uh, presentation. And that I am Shannon Foos. I am your presenter as the Head of Standards and Associations for the FDT group. So what that means is our standards activity is around taking the specifications that all of our wonderful volunteers within our organization write for FDT about the base technology and the protocol annexes and move that into being a standard within the international community with the IEC standard or with some of the regional standards organizations, including ISA or the American National Standards Institute or uh, the GBT standards uh, within the China region. From an association's perspective, you know, that means uh, dealing um, with activities with other organizations like the FDT group. Go back. Um, and, and we've got two that are very important to us uh, at this point in time. One is with Namor, around Namor Open Architecture. And the second one is around OPCUA and their field exchange protocol. So I think you've heard Steve mention some of the conversations he's had this week while he's been at Hanover. So, um, you know, the FDT group is very collaborative uh, when it comes to working with other standards organizations that uh, impact industrial automation and specifically around the networks and, and device configuration. So, so our formal relationships are with the organizations you're seeing on the slide. So you can see that uh, we deal with a number of protocol organizations. And keep in mind, our protocol annexes cover more protocols than the organizations that we have official relationships with. Uh, but those are just the organizations that we formalized relationships with. Um, and then you see the standards organizations that we have relationships with, as well as some of the other associations. So, you know, notable is FDI. Um, you know, the FDT group, along with the OPC Foundation and the Fieldcom group and Profibus are the owners of the FDI specification. You know, we, we talked about the OPC Foundation. So our traditional relationship with the OPC Foundation has been a collaboration on information models. So you can think about getting information from the device level up. And then uh, Pactware has been a great relationship for us as Pactware is an implementer of FDT technology. And, and, and you heard Paul mention uh, Pactware in his discussion. It is a widely used uh, FDT um, device configuration methodology. You know, so if we move into our strategic initiatives, you know, we've got Namor uh, who has been very active lately and we love getting the end user perspective. 
So Namor provides that for us. And as we engage with them on the more open architecture, we are starting to, to learn uh, on both sides, actually. Uh, we're starting to learn and we're starting to educate uh, uh, some of the Namor folks on opportunities for collaboration. So we are in the early phases of those discussions and looking forward to, to continuing those discussions. And our relationship with OPC, you know, is, is evolving as uh, OPC and their technology capabilities evolve. So no longer are we talking to OPC Foundation only about getting information out of the field device through an information model, uh, which, which we've had for our, uh, a number of years by now, um, but also taking advantage of uh, the OPC UA field exchange. Uh, protocol. So if we look at what we're doing in the standards world, so starting with the international standard, you know, uh, FTT has been an IEC standard uh, for half a dozen or more years. So we've had continual activity within the IEC uh, as we've evolved the standard. So with FTT 2, we standardized that within IEC in about the 2016 timeframe. And with FDT3, our specifications were mature enough that we started our standardization um, in March of last year. And those uh, activities will continue until about March of next year. So you know, if you can think about the activity to standardize the body of specifications that our volunteers have worked on and our, our technical experts have worked on, you know, you're talking about two years to, to get those documents formatted and, and through the procedures of the IEC organization. So when you think about the breadth of the FDT standard, so we've got 34 documents in total that we are managing and, and, and those documents have a variety of uh, maintenance requirements that we'll talk about. So, if we look at our participation at the international level, uh, the international committees um, are organized by country. So we have a number of countries represented. So we have Canada, Germany, France, Japan, and um, always looking for new members in to help with the diversity of our international representation. So if you're in a country and it's not listed and you have an interest in participating, please reach out to myself or to Katie Jones on the chat. And particularly in the US, we're, we're searching for a new member as we've had some uh, retirements affect our coverage uh, from the US. So if we look at those 34 documents that we have within the IEC, you see that um, you know, they're organized by some of them apply to any version of the FTT technology and others are technology dependent. Um, and you know, we talked about having the core uh, documents as well as the protocol annex documents. And then you know, at the bottom, you'll see our FTT OPC UA information model and our style guide, uh, which are critical elements to create consistency within the specification. Moving on to some of the regional activities. So our alignment with the ISA organization um, goes back even further than the dates here, but uh, our last activities was in January of 2019. We had the FTT standard approved. And then shortly after that, we moved into a liaison relationship. So where the ISA and the IEC activities are essentially moving in parallel. Um, and Ian Verhappen, as a member of the IEC committee, is working to, to bring all that information back to the ISA committee. And Ian's been doing a great job for us on the ISA standardization. So we really appreciate his help. Within the, the China region, the GBT uh, standard. So uh, as we get ready, so We've been a China standard. I, I don't have the date with me for also for a number of years. And as we look forward with the FDT three activities, we have the opportunity to update the standard as our IEC documents get finalized. So we're looking at that opportunity later this year. And you know, that will have a budget implication for 2023. 
And you know, the feedback that we get uh, from our China board is that standardization is critical to drive local adoption. So our China board has two priorities, uh, and that is having a local standard and having local test and certification activities. So happy to, to be engaged and, and make sure that we're doing everything that we can to meet the requirements of uh, the, the China of the China market to make sure FDT is suitable for that space, for that market. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Okay. If not, and we can we can take questions too. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Appreciate that. We're going to turn it over to uh, Saria, uh, heads of our technology work and. Uh, Rhea, I'll let you take it away to talk about what's going on there. Yeah. Okay, you can see my presentation. Perfectly. Thank you. Yep, looks good. Right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Surya. I'm uh, responsible for the technology on the FTT group. I would provide an update on the status of the technology. Uh, so the specification milestones, I think uh, maybe this is nothing new. I'm just trying to summarize uh, what we have got. So we released uh, FTT3 in 2020, and we also had a 2.x version released in uh, 2012, and uh, also the 1.x was released in 2001, so more than 20 years FTT is providing the device integration. Of course, we evolved from COM to uh, .NET, and now we are becoming a platform independent. So on the FTT3, um, basically what I mean by development and release is because we have three different versions of the specification. And uh, so we have uh, some kind of uh, which specification is active or which specification is in maintenance mode or which specification is development so that to have uh, resources and everything working on there. Um, so for FTT 3.0, the specification is kind of uh, development and also released because the core spec is released, the, more, the next specifications are being developed uh, now. So in the last year, we have uh, updated the uh, ModBus and also the OPC UA Annex specifications. And uh, we have also keep on updating the test tools and certifications. We have updated the uh, DTM Inspector 5, which will certify the for FTT3 DTMs. And uh, it's now uh, completed and we have to get the XCOM approval. And also we have the certification policies and procedures. And we have also completed the auditing of the test side, which uh, Steve already shown in his uh, presentation. Uh, and for the common components, uh, all the three common components, the DTM and uh, desktop and server common components for FTT3 are available. And uh, the style guide is mandatory. I think that's also shown in the, uh, in, in the presentation previously highlighted by Steve. For FTT2, the specification is active and support stage, and we have updated, um, uh, we are working on the IO link annex, and also the FFH1 annex is work in progress. And for the test tools, uh, we have updated as a part of maintenance uh, for fix for some uh, log for net issue. And uh, also we have updated the CCs uh, to, to keep the requirements that are coming in. Um, so that's about the status of 2.x. And for FTT 1.x, this is uh, basically maintenance and support. It's basically we do on the kind of a critical security kind of updates. So we have updated the uh, CIP Annex and Modbus Annex. And uh, for the testing tool also, we have uh, updated for the DEP future. And uh, of course, common components is not available for the uh, 1.x. Primarily, common component supports FTT2 and uh, FTT3. Uh, basically, this is the summary uh, of overview of uh, the specs that are available. 
and uh, what are in the work in progress. So basically, uh, the core spec for all the versions is available. And for FTT3, uh, we have made recently the uh, Modbus and OPCA available, style guide and uh, CCs are all made available. Hub is uh, work in progress. The first version is completed. Uh, but once the certification is really ready and uh, once a vendor gets certified, we have one of the vendor waiting for the certification, then we should have it on the hub. And uh, the DTM inspector, as I mentioned, is also available. And I will link uh, DTM. It's a kind of a interpreter DTM is also available. And uh, the uh, FFH1 Annex and IO Link Annex, they will also continue to develop the FTT3 once they complete the TurarX. So that's kind of the uh, summary uh, for the spec. I think uh, this is what Steve uh, was highlighting the uh, FTT uh, UE. So the digital transformation now starts. So basically, the spec, the tools, style guide, OPC, uh, information model, and the communication and access and the IO Link interpreter DTMs are available. And uh, if you need to get that, I think uh, please contact the uh, FTT Group Business Office. Probably they will guide you to get these uh, components. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ria. Okay. If there's any questions, I don't see any here. Uh, we'll kind of keep moving. Surya, one question just came up. It is, what is the current status of a COM DTM for Profinet? Uh, we are still, I mean, they are talking about FTT3, I presume. Uh, so we are uh, working on creating the Alex group for Profinet. And we need volunteers if uh, somebody has interest on Profinet. Uh, we appreciate uh, to join us. And, we could work together to get that next. So it sounds like the answer to that was, if that's something you need, uh, let's let's get involved in the working group to get it done. Is that what I thought I heard? Yes, that's right. Okay, <laughs> okay. got it. All right, thank you. Uh, anything else that you see there, Katie? Nope, that's it. Great. All right, let's go ahead and take this home. The last update here from an informational standpoint is around marketing. Uh, there's a number of things that have gone on. Uh, we started to drive more media coverage here recently, uh, you know, with different things that are going on in both uh, the Control magazine um, and, uh, you know, we've done a, a set of uh, a podcast here just recently with Control. Uh, you know how FTT fits into the whole idea of Industry 4.0, and then uh, with a couple of white papers also um, that have been uh, provided and distributed. And these are all, you know, obviously available after uh, as content uh, that can be used for other purposes. But again, those those showed up as from a media standpoint, advertising. It's a few ads that are running uh, around FTT. Uh, obviously, uh, one in English there, one in Chinese. Um, we've got a uh, newsletter that goes out every quarter. Maggie does a great job uh, basically making sure that this thing gets put together. She does a good job on all of it, but uh, really this is this runs uh, you know pretty regularly. I know we've got a number of members that are actually providing uh, content and also supporting the newsletter program. Uh, I'll be honest with you, originally when I was involved, I questioned the newsletter program. It's only four times a year, so uh, we're going to keep doing that as we go forward here. Uh, and so there's a few new brochures that have been created and a white paper, uh, again, talking about the unified environment and, and why it's the unified environment and uh, you know how it comes together and what are some applications for it. Okay, um, And then, of course, at the show, uh, trade shows. Right now, uh, we're at Hanover. We're actually part of the OPC UA booth. Uh, we've got a pretty large corner uh, in that booth, and uh, we're showing uh, products that you see here uh, from both process and the factory automation side. Um, and we're showing environment, actually uh, uh, showing the uh, container uh, and also uh, a, a demo 
with uh, FlowServe where they're showing off their uh, DTM um, and their Red Raven product, uh, which actually speaks real well to the whole idea of doing an application um, and, and a kind of a value add application and how they can have access to that. So they do that remotely. It's, it's very, very good looking demo and, and shows really well and has gotten quite a bit of interest. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, Thomas Hadlich has done a great job pulling this together for us uh, here in Germany uh, and getting us ready for the show. And uh, the one thing I'd say is that I think we're going to uh, also be at Akama. Uh, in fact, I'd say there's a very high probability we're working through the details there. So we will clearly be calling for another set of uh, companies that would like to participate with us in the Akama uh, show. Look, someday on trade shows, we may go back to how we were doing it brewing beer or whatever we thought we were doing with the big tanks and everything. But I think for right now, given kind of the state of uh, the world, we're just going to keep doing things the way and, and, and at least for Akama uh, going ahead and, and working with uh, the OPC uh, organization. Okay. Uh, so that's it as far as the marketing works concerned. Um, and since There is one question here. Um, it says one of the main factors that helped the growth and acceptance of FDT DTM technology was the wide availability of free tools such as Pactware and DTM container. Are there any plans to have similar to them but using FDI? Saria, do you have a perspective on that or Shannon maybe? Can I, can I, can you yeah. just, can you say the question once? Sure. Um, it says one of the main factors that helped the growth and acceptance of FDT DTM technology was the wide availability of free tools such as Paxware and DTM container. Are there any plans to have something similar to them, but using FDI? Uh, well, uh... At the moment, uh, we don't have any tools, but we were trying to uh, provide some kind of uh, DTM that could support uh, all the legacy DTs and uh, device package and also a device specific uh, DTM functionality with FTT3, but we are working on it. Uh, at the moment, we do not have any. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I'd say though is that there, you know, I think you will see uh, Pactware, though, supporting FDT, uh, FDT3, uh, probably later this year. Uh, so, you know, as far as the other part of the question, I guess I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Pactware officially have announced that uh, they are supporting FTP2 and also FDI. Uh, so they have uh, made an interpreter DTM to do that. So technically, it's available. There are vendors that are providing in markets. I meant the answer from the FTT group that we do not have any official such tools from the FTT group, but there are vendors who are trying to do it. Right, right. And I was just yeah, reacting to the FTT, or uh, I'm sorry, the Pactware part of it. So, yep. Okay. And there's a follow up question to that. It says, will the solution be similar to ENH IDTM technology? Uh, yes. I mean, there are many interpreter DTMs in the market. It is not, let's say, only ENH, but maybe interpreter DTM, IDTM is kind of a product name. But this EDD interpreter DTM, there are many companies uh, that have similar products. Okay. I think right. that I think that's it for our questions for now. Great. Okay. I need uh, that's terrific. I appreciate it. Uh, one last formal uh, request here of the group, uh, and we could just do this really quickly. There's a vote to adjourn the meeting. Those are all the topics that we had for today. Uh, and what I would like to do is get somebody to uh, give us a yes on that, and then I'm just going to ask for a second, and we will move on. 
So, uh, Katie, can you see that? Yes. We are good with the motion. Let me check right, the great. results. Okay, it passed. Okay. We can officially adjourn. That? Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you, listener. I appreciate everybody's time and attention. Uh, if you have any follow up, feel free to reach out to us. And I look forward to working with you as we uh, continue to move the uh, standard forward here. So. Uh, thanks for everybody's time. Appreciate it. Great day or evening or morning. See ya. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye.